All right, this is going to be hopefully a quick tutorial on how to use something like a Macbeth chart to match, let's say, a Fuji camera that is shooting in log with a Sony camera that is shooting in log. So the way we're going to achieve this is with a semi-advanced technique where we're going to build our own 3x3 matrix, and it's right here in the pipeline. And when I turn it on and off, you can see it's kind of rotating our colors around a little bit. And here's the difference that it makes. Um, and uh, so this scene was lit by kind of a cheap LED fixture, you know, certainly not a high CRI value fixture. Uh, you know, the color quality of the light's probably not all that great. Uh, but when I enable and disable, uh, you can see, so this is with it off. And when I turn it on, it's kind of darkening these reds a little bit, and it does genuinely match it very well to the uh, Sony footage that I had uh, collected here. And uh, so the question is, how do we derive this 3x3 three three matrix? Uh, and of course, why do we derive it the way that we do? Um, and so I did want to show that Resolve does sort of have a tool for this, but I don't like using it. Uh, so it is this color match thing here. Uh, and you know, you come in here and you tell it like, you know, what type of color checker you have. And then you come in here and, you know, you can kind of resize this box and try to analyze this. But I actually don't like using this tool. And the reason for it is because this is matching to a theoretical, you know, perfect observer. Um, but a lot of times you don't necessarily want that. Like, what if, um, you know, you're lighting the scene dramatically? Like, what if you're lighting your subject with a colored light and you intentionally, uh, you know, don't want the scene to look perfect, uh, but you still want to match other cameras maybe, especially if you're using like LED light fixtures and stuff like that. Um, so that's one reason I don't like this tool. Uh, and so, you know, one another question is like, why do we even need this matching at all? Like if we're using, you know, color space transforms and everything, you know, why do these cameras not just match? Uh, well, the reason for that is because each of these cameras is a different theoretical observer, you could call it. Um, they have different, you know, frequency responses to the light, um, which means they have different implicit biases in the way that they see the scene. And in fact, cameras can actually produce some pretty wild values, like, you know, values that are going way, like outside the spectral locus here, like, you know, theoretically imaginary colors. But of course, that's because the cameras don't really see color. They're just measuring these frequencies of light. Um, and so this pipeline is not really fit for human consumption until you have a output transform or an output, you know, sometimes called a, you know, display rendering transform. Uh, and that is actually what converts it uh, for a human observer to, to look at the scene and kind of takes it out of log. Um, but the question is, is there a way we can kind of match these observers uh, or at least try to get rid of their bias in a particular scene? And it turns out there is a way to do that. And just as a quick aside, if we take a trip to Hollywood, a lot of times what happens on major productions is the main production camera actually gets chosen as the primary observer. And not only do they use it as the primary observer, a lot of times they use the working space of that camera as well. You can see in this article from Avatar 2, they actually specifically mention using sgamut3.cine as their working space between all of the different vendors. And Steve Yedlin, who's an awesome DP that did uh, Knives Out, Glass Onion, and Star Wars Last Jedi, he has mentioned multiple times in interviews uh, doing this kind of matching. He actually has some behind the scenes videos on his website where he talks about uh, using Macbeth charts for things such as observer matching. And there's also HDRIs. Uh, these are a good way to capture both the diffuse and reflective lighting of a scene. These are very commonly used to light 3D objects or create skyboxes and things like Unreal Engine or Unity. And uh, you can see there is a Macbeth chart, and that's so that you can both check your linearity as well as matching observers. And while there are some industry standard working spaces like ASUS uh, that can, you know, maybe help to match the cameras under, let's say, perfect lighting conditions, oftentimes you still will need to match the observers by hand, not to mention ASUS has some of its own issues. So for our example in Resolve, I'm going to switch to a uh, new version of the timeline that I have here. And in this case, I've actually got a Sony camera, a Fuji camera, and an iPhone 15 Pro <laughs> in log mode. Uh, and you can see this is the uh, log footage, what it looks like here. Uh, so what we're gonna do is we're gonna go into Fusion, uh, and I have a whole bunch of nodes here, so I'll just go ahead and enable those. Uh, so the first one is just noise reduction. That's just cleaning this up a little bit. I'm just averaging the frames together. Then uh, I've got a transform node. This is just kind of zooming in on it just to make it easier to do our analysis. Uh, then I've got a color space transform. So what I'm gonna do is, I'm, in this case, it's the Sony. So I'm gonna go from our Sony working space that that camera uses, and I'm gonna bring all of the cameras to DaVinci Wide Gamut Linear. Uh, and that is both 
the space that I want to do my analysis in, and it's also the space I want to apply the 3x3 matrix in. Uh, so then I'm using a color corrector, and I'm just using the gain operator here just to uh, make this white patch get right. There's numbers down here just to get it right about 1.0. Theoretically, I think I could go above 100% because I'm exporting EXR files, but oh well, I just kind of made it so that they were all this, roughly the same gain. Uh, then I've got a blur node here, and again, this is just kind of, you know, to get rid of any last minute noise, just make sure these patches are all nice and unified. So then you right click, and we're going to go to Save Image. Uh, and we're going to save it as an EXR file. And you can see I've already got some in this uh, folder here. And so then what we're going to do, let me just uh, disable these so I don't forget. Uh, so the just to show that like the Fuji, for instance, uh, the only difference is right in this case. Oh, well, this, this is the iPhone. Sorry. But in this case, like I'm going Rec 2020, uh, Apple log, um, you know, and then the Fuji would have been, you know, F log two or whatever. Right. Um, so that's pretty much the only difference there. Um, so uh, then what we're going to do is run an analysis tool. So. I uh, took some code from this form post here on uh, Lift Gamma Gain, awesome website, uh, and this code uses a uh, some analysis tools from the Python Color Science Library. Uh, this is a pretty cool tool that's uh, pretty easy to install. It's just a couple, uh, you know, lines in uh, in Python to get it installed, uh, and it also uses this uh, color checker detection library, uh, which literally just detects a color checker in the image and lets you do some analysis. Uh, and so here's what that code looks like. Uh, so you can see we've got our source. In this case, uh, I'm using the uh, Fuji EXR and our target, which is the Sony EXR, right? And so that's the big difference, by the way, between this tool and this analysis tool is rather than matching to some kind of a perfect observer, we're actually going to pick our Sony camera uh, as our master observer. And then we're going to bring all of the other cameras to it. And speaking of perfect, you know, quote unquote, perfect observers, the other cool thing is we don't actually care what perfect is. In fact, this chart could be kind of old and worn out or, uh, you know, anything like that. And it almost doesn't matter because what we're going is we're, as long as, you know, these different cameras are seeing the same chart, we're just picking one as the master and then matching the others to it, uh, which means, you know, the, the actual like accuracy of these patches is almost like less critical. It just matters that they all saw the same patch. Uh, and so then we just run the analysis and then we literally just print the matrix into the shell. So here's uh, what this is going to look like. We're going to run our Python. It's going to analyze the files and then there it is. So it just prints the uh, resulting matrix. Now, uh, for anybody who's used a uh, three by three matrix or an RGB matrix, it might actually look familiar to this tool in Resolve um, because that's kind of uh, what this tool does. Uh, it's basically how much red is in your red, how much green is in your green, how much blue is in your blue, right? So you can take a bunch of red out of the red and then put green in the red. And you know you can do some pretty wild uh, transformations with this. Uh, but part of the problem is it's really hard to use this by hand. And also notice there's not very many decimal places. Like this isn't very precise. Even if you try to grab it here, it's just like not precise enough. So it's nice about what we're gonna do is we are going to have, as you can see, way more decimal places of precision. Um, so uh, what we're going to do is uh, I found some more code. Um, this is technically something completely unrelated. It was just some code I found on GitHub uh, for uh, a DCTL. Uh, and this goes from uh, XYZ to LMS. Um, we're not actually going to be doing that, but it happens to be a three by three matrix uh, operation. So I just kind of took this code as inspiration and I was able to build a DCTL with it. Uh, and so what we're going to do is we just take our uh, resulting uh, matrix here, these numbers, and we just kind of copy them over into here. Uh, and so this is, again, how much red is in your red, you know, how much green is in the red, how much blue is in the red. This is going to do our operation. Uh, and so then we're going to use this as a DCTL. DCTL is kind of like a LUT. Uh, except built with uh, sort of like a C code. Uh, and what's nice is it's GPU accelerated. Um, and because uh, it actually runs as a shader on the GPU, which is what's really nice. So uh, the way you load that in is you go into your, uh, your project settings, your color management, and you go down to uh, open LUT folder. Uh, and so uh, I just ended up putting some in here. You can see I had one in here, DCTL matrix test dot DCTL. Uh, and then once you do that, you have to close and restart resolve. Uh, but then what you do is you uh, you can come in your your uh, OFX, you grab your uh, DCTL and you plop it on there. And uh, then of course, I have a ton of uh, DCTLs in here, but you just find uh, whatever you named it, 
Uh, in this case, I'm using the uh, you know iPhone to Fuji because this was the uh, the iPhone, and uh, then we can do our match. So let me show you the workflow here. So uh, we're gonna start. Uh, on the Sony, which is going to be our master observer here. Uh, and so we've got our input transform. This is your like typical color management, right? Your input, your output, uh, your color management sandwich. So I've got our input uh, going from Sony to DaVinci Wide Gamut. That's what I'm using as the working space. I've got my, uh, you know, we'll call it the color grade. In this case, all I'm doing is I'm just adjusting the exposure here in, uh, in DaVinci Wide Gamut space because uh, I've got my uh, timeline set to, uh, oh, I should probably set that to uh, output there. But I got my timeline set to um, DaVinci Wide Gamut uh, so that I can just you know, use the HDR wheels to do our nice, you know, exposure adjustment here. Uh, and then uh, just to compare, so now here is, uh, let me show you the Fuji first. So the Fuji, we're going to go uh, Rec 2020 Fuji F Log 2 into our working space. So same way you, you know, typically do that. Uh, but then uh, you're going to apply your 3x3 matrix. Now this needs to be done, remember, in linear. And if you right click the node, you can see on gamma, I've got it set to linear. Uh, now, DaVinci automatically does the conversion for you because DaVinci knows the timeline working space. It's able to do that transformation. Now, an alternative to this is you could put a node before this and put a node after this, right? And you could have a, a color space transform that goes from, you know, DaVinci wide gamut, um, you know, to linear here. Um, you could do like linear and then, uh, you know, swap it back again. And then, so like theoretically, um, you know, these like make no difference now in the, in the waveform because they're like inverting each other. Um, so that is one way to do it. If you want to like convert to linear and then do your operation, then go back to your working space. But I find it easier most of the time to just, um, uh, to just, you know, use this function where you right click there. Uh, so then you've got uh, the grade. It's the same grade. I just copied it from the other camera. And then once again, you got your output DRT. In this case, I'm just using the resolve stock uh, output just to mention red gamma to 09. Uh, typically, you'd have tone mapping on. I just have it off for this uh, demo just because it gives a little more contrast to the scene to see the differences. Uh, the iPhone is uh, almost identical. Uh, the only difference in the iPhone uh, 15 is uh, I wanted to nudge the white balance a teeny tiny amount. So I grabbed our uh, chromatic adaptation plugin and just plopped it on there. You can see I set it to Rec 2020 Apple Log and I nudged it just the tiniest amount. You can see uh, it's like barely, you know, it's just like moving this a very slight amount. Um, I just wanted to, you know, nudge white balance and chromatic adaptation is a great way to nudge your white balance around. Uh, and then also the flare was off a little bit on the iPhone. Um, so the flare is just kind of the, basically the black level. Uh, I find the best way to do that once again in gamma linear, you uh, can just use your, uh, where is it here? It's not in the log wheels, it's a lift. You can see I moved it so slightly, you just see a negative here. But yeah, this is your, there's your flare adjustment. You can kind of see what that looks like there. I don't know why, I just found the iPhone, for whatever reason, always has a lifted flare uh, in the log footage. Maybe they just don't do a, good a job of profiling the iPhone or something, but yeah, so that's it. Uh, it's, uh, the main, you know, the, the main magic is, uh, is really just, you know, doing the analysis, uh, with, uh, this, um, oops, uh, with this code, uh, this Python library and, uh, and then loading the three by three matrix in, uh, you can see my white balance is off. So it's doing a little bit more heavy lifting here. Ideally you want to get the white balance as close as you can in camera. Cause then the three by three doesn't have to try to deal with that. Um, so yeah, my white balance is off when I shot this test. Uh, but you can see it still still did a great job between these cameras. You can see the depth of field, like this is less blurry, this is more blurry, like the, the optics, like obviously the lens of the iPhone uh, is not quite the same as the, the lenses that are on these other cameras, but it still did a really good job matching these. So, and one other thing to mention is that you might notice that like this light fixture, I had this like little red LED light in the background, doesn't quite match on the different cameras. And uh, that's for a couple reasons. So for one, Remember that the light that hit this chart, which is what we matched, is not the same spectrum of light that this fixture in the background is, right? So had we matched on this, we might have gotten a better result. But this is just kind of like, you know, a background object. Uh, the other thing is when you're this far out in the gamut, you know, when you're like out here possibly in the camera, uh, some cameras will just clamp that off when they convert to their working space. Uh, sometimes, you know, they just skew it way out because, you know, especially like some like blue LEDs especially are like a borderline UV. Um, and so it's really hard for uh, different cameras to kind of get those identical because obviously uh, it, it's actually the cameras manufacturers, they actually use a three by three matrix to get into 
uh, you know, whatever like gamma your camera uses, that's actually how they kind of do a best fit of whatever the sensor picked up into their space. And so uh, when they optimize their three by three matrix for doing that, they're usually prioritizing things like skin tones, right? Like they're not, they don't care about like some UV light in the background of a, of a shot. They want to make sure that like skin is going to match on all, on all the different manufacturers. So that's one reason that sometimes you'll still have these fixtures in the background and, you know, you either have to try some gamut mapping or you might just have to do some hue, hue versus hue. Um, so that can still be a little bit tricky, but obviously, you know, whatever your main light source is lighting your uh, main chart, that's the main thing that you want to match observers on. Uh, and that's pretty much it. Uh, let me know if you have any questions in the comments. Thanks for watching, guys.